Well, good morning. It's 8 a.m. and it looks like we've got uh, everybody here, or just about everyone. Uh, Olivia, would you do the roll call, please? And you're on mute. We could hear you all those times you asked if we could hear you, except that last one. I gotta get used to the headphones. Um, okay, we have Cameron Grant, Tom DeBee, Arlene Zortman, and Jean Christopher. We also have Polly Christensen, Kathy Fedler, Lisa Gallinar, Karen Roney, and Kendra Daniels. I'm trying to log on. And Harold's trying to log on. <laughs> and uh, Lauren Seeley is absent today, it looks like. Great, thank you. Uh, first item of business is approval of the minutes from our May 18th meeting. Those have been included in the packet. Does anyone have any uh, revision or other comment regarding those minutes? Arlene? Yeah, I mean, there, was, there was one area where there was a duplication of, of words, but I don't have that copy in front of me. Um, so I think we can just approve them. All right. Anything else? All right, well then let, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I so move. I second. A motion by Jean, second by Arlene. All in favor, thumbs up. That approved unanimously. Uh, next item for business would be public invited to be heard. Olivia, do we have anyone from the public who has indicated a desire to talk today? No, we do not. Okay, well then we'll move on to new and old business. Item four, a discussion of retreat items regarding LHA. And as I recall, the, uh, the council retreat is scheduled for <clears throat> the morning of July 9th, excuse me. <clears throat> and we have uh, quite a bit of information in the packet that I think mm -hmm. helps get us up to speed. Um, but is there someone that would like to take the lead on uh, warming us up into this discussion? Sure, I can do that. So I thought I would go through just a little bit on the, the financial and other tools available, um, then the land, um, kind of how it's outlined in the packet, some of the, the data um, that we provided, and then start going through um, the goals um, discussion, if that makes sense to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, um. So I wasn't sure how much you were able to re, um, read and digest, but um, just these are probably just some of the financial and other tools that are available to the housing authority. Um, I'm sure there are other ones that I have, have missed or forgotten about, um, but they, you do have a number of things that the housing authority uh, does have available to us. Um, currently you have a nonprofit partner with the LHDC. Um, which allows uh, the housing authority to do things that they otherwise could not do um, by working with that nonprofit partner. Um, nonprofits can often be more nimble um, than a HUD burdened, HUD reg burdened housing authority um, and often can access um, funding that requires a nonprofit status versus a housing authority. The other thing I didn't put down that I realized this morning, they also can go outside of the city of Longmont boundaries. Um, the LHDC is, covers the entire St. Brains Valley School District. So they do have the ability to go to Frederick Firestone and to Lyons. Um, they just have a broader area area if that's something um, that we want to continue to consider. Um, tax exemption status, um, LHA can provide tax exemptions to uh, other partners, either nonprofit or for-profit entities that are providing affordable housing. Um, and as soon as we got involved with the housing authority, the city did, um, it became very apparent. This is a very, very powerful tool that you have available um, to you. A lot of housing authorities charge pretty large sums of money um, to developers to um, use that tax exempt um, status. Um, so, and the monetary value can take a lot of different forms, actual cash payment upfront and or ongoing. Um, being able to have the housing authority be part of the project as a partner um, and an ability to negotiate other things that you might want like first right of refusal to purchase a property, et cetera. 
You have property management capacity um, that we are strengthening and getting um, into a uh, pretty good shape. So that is something that you could start offering um, in a partnership capacity. You don't have to own the properties to be able to manage them. So that is a, a service that you could charge. Um, also, you can hold land on behalf of others, which allows the land to be um, kept off the tax rolls until it's ready to develop. Um, you have a value in accessing other funding that especially for-profit developers cannot do. So one of the things with the Chrisman development is they're having the housing authority be the applicant to the state division of housing for additional funding because the, the housing authority would be eligible for a grant versus a loan if it's the um, actual developer that goes in and, and gets the funding. Um, <clears throat> bonding capacity and capability or bank qualified debt issuance. So housing authority bonds um, can be issued by the housing authority up to 10 million per year um, can be issued. Um, we have done this in the past, I think for Fall River, um, there was actually bonds that were um, um, issued for that project. Uh, the interest um, that's earned by investors is exempt from federal taxes um, and may also be exempt from state and local income taxes. So this is a, um, a valuable tool. <clears throat> and I know there's a couple of different instances like with the um, Longmont Christian Housing and Hover uh, Manor where um, we did, uh, the LHA did on behalf of borrowing. So actually went to the bank and got favorable, more favorable rates than a regular nonprofit because it's triple tax exempt, I think is um, the wording. So they actually borrowed the money and then turned around and lent it to the other um, nonprofit. So there's a couple of different um, ways you can, you can um, access funding to the benefit of others, which, um, brings money into the, the housing authority because you can charge to issue the bonds, you can charge for uh, an extra percentage of interest if it's a bank qualified, et cetera. Um, property and land value that, that you guys own, you can at different points in time divest yourself of some of the property or land at market rate prices and reinvest in other affordable housing development depending on what's going on. So if you remember um, not too long ago, the housing authority, um, I think it was the housing authority that owned those, divested themselves of Terry Street apartments, um, which were I think 21 total units um, on the... 600, 700 block of, no, 500 block of Terry Street um, and sold those at market rate um, prices and then turned around and reinvested those in Spring Creek and um, Fall River. So that is something that you could consider um, as some of the properties that you own come out of the tax credit if you wanted to do something like that instead of reinvesting just an option and of course the land that you own as well. Um, and then project-facing vouchers is, is highly valuable. Um, dedicating vouchers to a project provides um, additional subsidy and um, frees up equity and um, borrowing capacity for a project, especially when you're covering 30% and 40% AMI units. So it actually offsets the subsidy needed to provide those units and therefore lowering um, the um, funding needed to borrow for those to cover those units, and that frees up money um, that they could be um, borrowed for other um, investments. And it's in the range of, I don't have my figures right in front of me, but in the range of like $100,000 to $200,000 per voucher um, over the life of the project is what it, it brings in. Are there any questions on any of those tools, or did anybody think of any others that I had forgotten about or that you know we've used in the past? Okay. All right, then briefly going through the land that's available to the Longmont Housing Authority. Um, as you know, you own 3.8 acres um, jointly with the city at the Sunset Campus down by the suites. Um, and there is a map in there that shows how the property was subdivided with lot one being the suites property and lot two being the, um, the vacant land that's available. Um, it is under an option to purchase contract with Element Properties and they can take it down in chunks after subdividing it further. 
um, for project development, um, we would have to approve how they um, are choosing to subdivide that. The current proposal is for 55 units of permanent supportive housing to go down in that southwest corner of lot two. Um, and then there is possibility for additional development on lot one in that southeast um, corner of the current parking lot. Um, so that is another option that might be available. That suites property is is over parked, well parked for for what um, is down there. So there there is a um, ability to um, perhaps develop something further down there. And then of course you own 2.4 acres of land at the Hover Crossing campus, right? Um, west of Hearthstone and Lodge. Um, this is owned by the LHDC via a loan from the city, um, which needs to be repaid in um, March of 2023, unless it's extended further. Um, it has long been thought of for family housing, perhaps rental townhomes that would tie in um, the neighborhood a little bit um, more similar similarly than to put in another um, large rental project on the property. Um, but obviously that is, that's your choice. There's nothing that says you have to do that. Um, <clears throat> but it might be a good segue for the neighborhood because there's single family houses to the, the north and east um, of Hearthstone Lodge. And then you've got Hearthstone Lodge and then this property. So maybe something like an Aspen Meadows neighborhood townhome um, property. Um, is there any questions on that? Hey, Kathy, do you want to kind of talk about the, do you want me or do you want to talk about the conversations that we're having with that company out of, or I think we have already done it, but Pina Vista. And then Arlene the had a question too, I think. Arlene, why don't you go first? Yeah. It's actually kind of a little bit more than one question. Um, on the... 3.8 acres at Sunset Campus, I noticed that there is a floodplain there. What kind of impact is that going to have on the use of the land? Um, if I'm looking at the, in terms of the area that is where the existing building is, um, there's not a floodplain issue there. So if you take the existing footprint, mm -hmm. um, we're, we're clear there to the, I'm trying to, see the position there to the south. Um, and as I look at it, we actually do have some room as we get closer to Spring Gulch to move. Um, I think the floodplain really encompasses the area that we, we will have to have as a walkway pathway as part of the future development of that as a greenway. That's already, the easements are already there for the city on that side. So it's actually more clear than it would appear and that's really, if you look at the capacity that's in the gulch is just to the west of there and as it's moving east in the depth. So we, we didn't really see the issues floodplain wise. Okay. Like we would in other areas. Is there public transportation available to the people if we add some more units out there, public, uh, the bus goes out there? Um, the okay. bus goes just to the west of there. I know there's, um, stops around village at the peaks and i think if we add more they may be more willing to put an additional stop just because of what's there but it's not far from there okay and if you want to add some more units in lot one how many units are you looking at at this point well that how many was in that uh kathy do you remember how many was in the element 55 okay yeah, I'm guessing somewhere in the 40 to 50 range, you could, that would probably yeah. be the, the most. Okay. And then on the um, 2.4 acres at Hover Crossing, I know you're looking at family housing. Um, how many units and then how many bedrooms? And then is there a possibility, I know that you're thinking townhomes to kind of make it blend in with the area over there, and I don't have a problem with that. I'm just wondering if we could incorporate some condos in there, say like maybe in a two, three level that would give additional housing and maybe be a little bit more affordable. So that one's the one that I was talking about, um, talking to you all about. So there is a, a company that we were introduced um, mm -hmm. and I forgot their name, but they're out of Buena Vista and they do um, manu 
and when I say the term manufactured housing, don't think of what you traditionally think manufactured housing looks like. Um, Pre they, prefab, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's more a prefab, but they come in mm -hmm. and they, they build them in a plant and then they come in and they stack them and they do everything from uh, market rate to affordable, although they're, they're, um, their models built on trying to provide affordable housing. So um, they work with a company out of Berkeley that really does this affordable development. And so what you'll have to do is really come in with um, a development partner and run through some iterations in terms of how much space you have, what it looks like, what can fit, because what you're gonna to try to do is maximize your value on the mm -hmm. land um, and provide as many units as you can in a way that serves the individuals. Um, so we will be, as we look to that, we will be working with different groups um, and groups that really specialize in the affordable housing world and trying to achieve our goal. Um, so it's hard to say what it is right now, but we really want the experts to come in and know what we need to do and then really manage our parking requirements and all of those things to ensure we're maximizing the use of the land but really providing high quality um, housing for families. Okay. So more to come on that, more to come on that one once we start getting into design options. Okay. Yeah, we'd want Carol, to was that, was that Fading West? Is that the company in Buena Vista? I think that's so it. They, they, they do some, it almost looks like a new urbanist community yeah area. yeah so it is that fading west group i think that's yeah. the name of them and they're the ones that did the affordable housing there and where it's really attractive to us as a community is um we're also having conversations if there's an interest in building <clears throat> excuse me a manufacturing plant here on the front range and so and and i can tell you that i know that there's a market rate developer working to partner with them too so if we can sort of all coalesce around the same time frame, then we get a different economy of scale and a different price point because of the transportation cost. But yeah, it's sort of a new urbanist design, dense, um, open green spaces in, um, really attractive. And, you know, frankly, their price points go from, I would say 250 upwards to 550. So that's why we say they get into the market rate too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I, I won't go through the statistics um, of the housing choice voucher um, information that I provided unless anybody has any specific questions. I think suffice it to say that we are reaching very low income, um, very, very, the extremely low is the 30% and below primarily. Um, with those, um, with that program. Um, it's a good distribution between elderly, disabled, and households, um, families. Um, race, race and ethnicity um, is, is good and reflective of the community. Um, the size of household is skewed towards one and two people because of, primarily because of the, the high number of elderly um, that we do have in, in properties. Um, and then what was a little bit surprising to me was the amount of time that folks have been on the program. Um, I thought this would be a little bit lower, but the majority have been on 10 to 20 years on the program. So, um, so that's a little interesting, I guess. Um, and we need and to- Kathy, the, all these statistics that you gave us, are these uh, the current LHA program? Correct. The current well, we LHA do. voucher and um, uh, tenant-based voucher and uh, project-based voucher information. It well, actually, it was pulled in February, so it's not totally current. But it's this year current. <laughs> I gotcha. Okay. okay. Yeah. Which Kathy's a total of about how many households? <sighs> Is it four hundred and some? Yes, four, four hundred two, four yeah. okay. ten, something like that. Okay, so what I did um, based on the discussion that we had at the May meeting, um, I did pull in um, the LHA mission, the five-year plan mission, if you remember the five-year admin plan um, that we reviewed early in 2021 and that the, um, 
the housing board adopted. Um, and then the city and LHA merged vision. So those are at the top of the, the next page. Um, and then looking at the feedback that we got from May, just some of the comments that were made, um, and looking at the five-year plan goals, which are is that um, uh, document that we had to do for HUD, it seemed like the overall uh, uh, goals fit pretty well with where you were going and what kinds of things you were thinking of. Um, so what I thought was, I what I did was I added in, in red color um, some of the additional ideas that you, you guys tossed out at the uh, May 18th meeting. Um, I had a, at least one item in blue that I remember that we have discussed in the past that I added in there. And then everything in black is what's it currently in the five-year plan. Um, I know that's something that you wanted to review again. So it seemed like this might be a good time and it might be a good framework for pulling something together, some recommendations um, for the, the Board of Commissioners when they have their retreat um, on July 9th. Um, so if that makes sense, um, I can briefly go through the, the five goals um, and kind of what is on there. Um, or if you're ready to just jump in, that's fine too. If you had a chance to review it, I just wasn't sure how much time that you've had to, to give to this. Um, some of the later pages just show again what has been accomplished. Um, over the past several years um, under each of those goal categories um, and um, what you continue to uh, do and provide. So how would you like, you want me to go through the goals or do you want to just start discussion? So Kathy, can I, can I ask a question before we jump in? And this may be the result of me missing the meeting last month, but um, as it relates to our role as the advisory board, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I'm plugged into where we're supposed to be because it, it's, it's been so many years actually being the LHA that sometimes I have to remember to make sure that we're wearing different hats right now. Uh, but but am I right that our, our role on this would be to kind of review this and comment and then make a, a recommendation to LHA that would say, these are some goals that we would recommend that you consider. Here are our comments, and then and then then we step back and LHA adopts whatever they want to adopt. Hopefully, listening to some of our advice, right? I think that's what we're shooting for. Okay. Um, you know, so with that, I I think it probably makes sense just to dive in. I don't know that we need a a, a summary review, um, especially if these were discussed last month, uh, but if anyone wants to wave their hands as we roll through it, I think we could slow down and uh, as much as needed. All right, well, why don't we dive in? I could, I could share my thoughts first on where I see kind of our, our major goals. Um, I mean, one, one of the things that I want to um, see is just we just kind of have our development projects kind of in the hopper as as we're needing them um try and develop you know three every three to five years have something in the hopper so that we can have that that we're going to work with a developer to get additional affordable housing um and then in terms of that uh, if that isn't an option then you know we work with possibly um Kind of the other goal of um, seeking out some of the affordable housing projects that might be going offline or uh, seek out additional um, um, projects that we could just take over and convert those over to affordable housing but i, I see us as you know every three to five years i would like you know a development project kind of coming online or um, at least we're planning for it so is that, does that fit under number one here the, to create affordable housing opportunities for the community? Right. So Tom, the, the last objective on page 15, 
um, purchase properties going out of LIHTC or other subsidies to preserve affordable homes would fall under your acquisition opportunities, as well as I assume market homes. So maybe expand that to be market rate as well. Right. Okay. And... Is the development projects lined up and ready to go? Is that covered under the first objective there, expanding rental housing opportunities for low income and vulnerable populations? Or do you want it to be more specific around? Well, I think we can maybe uh, expand that a little bit more and just saying, you know, we're, we're looking for opportunities to yeah, expand the opportunities and uh, seek development. Um, Keep opportunities coming. Yeah. Polly? Uh, I really like all of the, uh, unsurprisingly, um, all of the um, blue things that have been added because I think we need to um, really be a little more aggressive about or broader in terms of how we're thinking of a housing authority. Um, I would also, I, I really like what Tom said, and I, um, I would also expand that because right now, I don't know if we have any money, anything that we are, well, doing Christmas. Next time something comes up, if it's coming up soon, we, uh, because of the cost of, um, of materials right now, because of the disruption of uh, all the distribution and a, and a number of other things, um, I think we could expand some of these things to not just purchase market rate homes, and um, purchase properties going out of uh, LIHEC, um, but also purchase some things that are uh, motels and hotels and trailer parks. Because if we can't build anything right now, this would be a good time to be thinking about buying things that are already made or homes that are, um, uh, that need a complete rehab that no one in their right mind wants to take on. Um, but uh, I do think this is a good time to think about if we cannot build something in a feasible way right now, then buy up some things that are um, for various reasons uh, coming up for sale. Trailer parks, as we all know, are the largest um, uh, non-subsidized provider of affordable housing in the country. And right now they're all being purchased by um, large corporations that turn them into kind of a nightmare, uh, <laughs> an unaffordable nightmare. And if we can buy them and then have people buy them back from us or have them converted through rock into a co-op, then we create something that's much more sustainable. We're doing good on the front end by helping people and then we turn it over to them and create something sustainable. So that would be my preference too, is to add on to uh, the top of either the bottom of page 15 or the top of page 16 to include uh, hotels, motels and trailer parks. Arlene? Um, I think it's an interesting idea to look at hotels and motels. And I, I think that might be a way to get people to, you know, at least get off the streets or get some kind of housing. When I was looking at the charts, um, it was really obvious to me that when we're looking at families versus seniors, that there's a significant difference there between you know what's needed and the fact that women single women make up a large majority of the families and so i'd like to see what it is that can be done to help those single women with their families um, find some kind of housing and in order to do that we'd also have to provide some sort of child care i'm sure but um, i think we need to take a look at at those at those women and there may even be men single men that are out there that are raising families i think we need to take a look at those people um the other thing that i i'm not quite sure how this works um i am wondering whether we should incorporate 
the different ages, the different generations into the facilities, rather than separating seniors um, out from the families, uh, put them all into kind of the same areas, not particularly across the parking lots like Aspen Meadows is, um, but into the same buildings, because I think you get some sort of a really neat cultural diverse um, interaction there with seniors and disabled and veterans and families and they can all, there's just a lot of history that can go on. There's just a lot of um, information that can be shared. And I think that that's, that's kind of a good way to, rather than separate people out, I'd like to see us bring more people together. So Arlene, is the objective on page 15 focus on family slash mixed age rental housing? Does that capture that? Yes. Okay. And then the, on the daycare, I did add objective mm -hmm. five based, based on, on the conversation that there was last um, in, at May. And one of the objectives on there is providing daycare on some of the properties and or future properties. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good idea. And I think that if we're going to take a look at single mothers, I think we need to take a look at, can we work with maybe um, front range community college in getting some education for those single parents. And if that's the case, then we may need to expand that childcare um, into the evenings or even say on a Saturday um, in order to help them move a little bit out of their, um, their level where they're at and into a different situation, which is actually good for the kids to see and then is really good for the parent as well. Holly. Thank you, Arlene, for mentioning uh, single parents. I, having been one, having been a divorced mother, I, you know, there's nothing available. And uh, single mothers, there are at least, uh, and there are single fathers too, of course, uh, there are at least 12 million single parents supporting their households in this country. That means there are at least... Uh, roughly 36 million people in that situation, if you're counting approximately two kids. Um, and uh, they, they have no childcare. Without childcare, they can't go to work. They are the only support. There is nothing in this society and nobody talks about it and single mothers are made to feel ashamed. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a really, really critical thing. And childcare is a huge part of that. That's why a lot of women are not going back to work. You know, in our, um, I'm sorry, in our, um, during COVID, uh, we've lost a huge amount of daycare. And uh, so anyway, that's, it's a really important concept that we, we actually think about protecting and trying to help out the most vulnerable uh, one of the most vulnerable groups in our society. So can I ask a clarifying question on, on daycare and educational opportunities, et cetera? I am assuming it would be, we would want to do partnerships as opposed with existing resources or to partner with, I know Karen's group um, and the human service agency um, funding process does a lot of work on funding affordable quality childcare um, and um, early education programs as well, um, that we would want to more partner with existing things that are going on and or help expand in some way um, opportunities, maybe by providing a building that somebody could come into when we're developing as opposed to the housing authority providing the services themselves. Mm -hmm. I just want to be clear if that's the direction that we're wanting to go and, and really focus more on, on how can we support and um, partner with um, some of these services and programs as opposed to recreating or creating new ones? Well, I don't think we need to get into the daycare business, but there are plenty of, of uh, organizations that do that and plenty of daycare things that do that, that we could we could partner with, as you say, what they lack often is a building or uh, something, some way to partner with people to make things a little more um, economically feasible for them. So that would be ideal, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, as I do think, as Arlene said, there would be a lot of synergy 
if uh, with mixed groups, in fact, you might find that some of those groups would also be able to be employed at the daycare centers. So on site, so that would be terrific. Yeah, I and think I think, I'll oh, go ahead, Arlene. Um, and I think if you, you partner with some of the learning places like Front Ridge Community College, whatever else there is that gives people the opportunity to maybe possibly get some sort of a nursing degree or, or some sort of a business degree that moves them out of the, you know, working at McDonald's, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but moves them maybe into a more steady, um, not quite all the time working Saturdays, Sundays, evenings, um, and is, provides, makes it better for the, for the children. Um, and seniors, the thing that I have seen at some daycare centers is that seniors are very, very helpful in maybe just coming in, um, holding babies, rocking babies, reading to the children, and they do that on a volunteer basis and those kind of things. If you've got them in the same buildings, um, maybe just set aside an area where a daycare could be. Uh, those are things I think to kind of look at in, in the future or when we're remodeling or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So what I'm hearing is determine how to support educational and growth, growth goals of our residents through par community partnerships. Yeah, yeah. And Kathy, um, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Um, because I, I like what Arlene and Polly are talking about. And um, you remember the RISE program, okay? Um, I don't want to see a duplicate of that because that was very heavy administration um, and very, uh, you know, very involved. But it seems um, that there is a set of services that we could coordinate. And I would like to see um, the housing authority track the people that are in it. Um, and that was one of the benefits of RISE, you remember too, Polly. Um, <clears throat> but um, but to offer it on a coordinated basis and track it, because in addition to daycare and educational opportunities, um, a lot of the people, especially the family level people, need to learn um, the nuts and bolts of credit and financial planning. Uh, and a lot of them need parenting skills. So there's a complete package that we could coordinate, but not necessarily administer. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and in terms of the um, mix of senior and family, uh, as, as long as people know when they move in that that's what's happening, uh, I think that's, that's awesome um, uh, because it, Quite frankly, I think having young people around keeps seniors younger longer. So um, one of the questions I had for you, Kathy, when you were uh, I'm backing up to the statistics that you had in the presentation, um, you were surprised at people being 20 years or 10, 20 years in the program. Were you specifically talking about Section 8? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, Deb. Yeah, it wouldn't be as surprising in our properties to, to see that, especially the, the senior properties, you know, that folks are there for quite a quite a long time. Yeah, well, uh, it, it, the senior hopefully, properties. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, well, well, the senior properties, you know, 90% um, of the, or better of the, you know, when people leave here, it, it's because they're not going anywhere else. Um, so they do stick around. We've got people here that have been here 13 years. So um, I was just curious. But also, again, if we're looking at Section 8 and people being on it so long. They're on Section 8, but I don't think we've provided a support system to get them off. I think RISE was the first inroad to that. Um, I may be wrong, but if we're going to do this and we want people to succeed, um, we, we need to provide more than just housing, but not necessarily we provide it directly. We provide the opportunity and, and encourage it. 
Gene, I think you make a, a really good point with that, and, and others have brought this same thing up. And for me, I think back to you know, what does the LHA do? What is our core? And maybe I'm overly simplistic, but when I look at it, I think we we can administer and manage things. <clears throat> we can I get access to uh, different financial tools that you know Kathy went through at the beginning, and we have some property that we can let people use. And the the question as we start talking about support services is uh, where do we we stop and, and transition to others who offer those support services? So I, I would just suggest that we be careful that that what we're doing is really linked to maybe those three things that we do at a basic level. Um, and then as we start to get farther away from that core, we need to enlist outside agencies to, to pick that up. It's not to say we don't want to do another RISE program, but we may not want to be responsible for the core administration of it. We may want to encourage it and provide a space for it and connect our residents to it, but not, not be the one running the show. Yeah, it, it, I, I agree with yeah. you totally, Cameron. I agree with you totally. And Cameron, if, I'm sorry, Gene. Yeah, if I can jump in, it's really kind of the hat sex piece for me. And so on the housing authority side, facilities, housing, those types of issues, that's this hat. Take this hat on, put the city man, <clears throat> put the city manager hat on, and it's leveraging the programs that we have in our uh, fa youth and family services, where they do parenting classes and things like that, or leveraging the programs that we have via our economic developments and partnerships with Workforce Boulder County to then engage Workforce Boulder County with the same group that we're providing parenting classes to. And so, to your point, and I agree with this completely, it really is taking the resources that we know we have available. And we may just, it may be as simple for the housing authority as we become the connector. And then from the city side, we then take the connections and start fleshing them out via our partnerships. And, and then they come in and provide the service. But at the end of the day, it's a seamless sort of one-stop shop for the people who live in the housing authority properties where they have access to this, but neither the city nor the housing authority is doing it all. Yeah. It's sort Harold, of yeah. yeah. Harold, you just hit on why I really wanted LHA to go under the city because the city does have access and if not the resource, you have the access. And that's exactly what I saw is it simply the, the connector right. to get the resources used. So I'm you're you're, you're talking my language. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. And it ties into one of the council's goals, too, where they wanted to get out with, like, <clears throat> this is pre-COVID, revamping the mayor's book club and how different council members get into different locations. Seems simple, and it is, but impactful at the same time because we're not relying on private locations for space. We can do it in different ways now that we're together. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. Karen? Karen? Go ahead. Karen, I see your Yes. Yeah, thank hand. you. So I so I just had a question and maybe this is uh I'm I'm guessing this is for Kathy. So um I know that some other housing authorities do offer a family self sufficiency program. And is that you know funded sep so it so how are how are those funded? Um, are those funded separately, or I, I was just curious? Yeah, so I think, and, and Lisa might know more as well. Um, I, I think it might now be called moving to work. I can't remember if family self sufficiency and moving correct. to work are the same, is, or they've become that's correct. Come one, um, and it's a separate application. It's separate funding. It's separate rules and regs. Um, I know BHP Boulder Housing Partners is a moving. They have moving to work vouchers um, and operate a program. I don't know if Boulder County Housing Authority does or not. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to have more than one in an area. Um, we just haven't been able to get into that yet, trying to shore what we have before we explore. No, yeah, no, but I, but I yeah, that's, that's an opportunity. That is an perhaps. opportunity. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify that I was just interested because I know that it is offered and yeah, it is moving to work. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, so it could be a combination, you know, like some of the our properties are permit supportive housing. So support services are part of that. Um, 
and so what kind of combination of bringing entities in, um, what we might we be able to apply for and provide support. So uh, thanks for clarifying that. You know, as, as we work through these, I look at, I'm looking at these objectives um, and with maybe one exception under this item one, I don't know how to know if we've gotten there. So, you know, five years from now, have we achieved this? And the only one that has, and maybe I'm trying to channel a little bit of Dr. Waters here with metrics, but um, there is the objective that talks about gaining 10 new private market property owners willing to participate in the HCV program. So we can measure that one. Uh, all, the others are all pretty nebulous. And I wonder if we wanna, maybe not in this moment, but at some point try to distill those down to some targets that we can pursue. Yeah, I would, I would suggest um, if we go through these and, and determine what package um, per se, we might want to provide to um, the LHA board um, for their consideration, see what they choose and come back with, because they might have other ones that they want to add, or there might be some that they don't want to, to include. And then, yeah, absolutely. We're going to have to drill down and, and figure out how we're going to do it and how we're going to measure it. You are correct. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Harold. And I guess that was kind of one of my questions, because this is obviously what you all did pre us coming involved. But I think as we look at this, mm -hmm. we need to frame the new objectives into to how can you actually measure them and how can you determine success? And, and so I think that's part of the conversation we want to have is with you all and the Housing Authority Board is, sort of, is take these and reformat them in a way that we can measure them and measure our progress on an annual basis to know, are we, are we doing what we said we were going to do? And I've kind of, I, I've even struggled with that. So I mean, it's. And, and I, I was, as I was reading through this, I was thinking about, you know, how we're, we're linking them. I, I was looking up right above the five-year plan goals that it talks about the, the city LHA merged vision that's to build a continuum of housing opportunities. Uh, and and also wondering if we're trying to um, collaborate to achieve some of the goals in Envision Longmont, or is there some other larger connection we're trying to make so that we're all pushing in the same direction? And we're we're not doing an LHA thing over here, and the city's doing something different over here without that that connection. I, I would say so far we're very well aligned. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the, the Envision Longmont goals are, are pretty broad. Um, they do include attainable and affordable housing um, and partnership opportunities, early childhood education, all, all of those kinds of things. So um, I guess the other thing I would throw out is maybe give some thought to do we need so many <laughs> objectives as well because <laughs> no. to manage and measure etc can be then a full-time job <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of the number three um that, that's that's the one when i ran out of energy for, for for more kids in my family and so i've kind of used that as a guide that once i get past three i run out of steam <laughs> um, if we could be a little more especially since it's five years that's not a long time so we, we might want to pare this down over time. It, one other comment that I want to throw in, and then we got to roll on to two, three, four, and five. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if in this objective number one, or maybe even a, an overarching goal that we, um, we make some reference to the fact that we want to say, create affordable housing opportunities, uh, aligned with the goals of and using the resources of our partnership with the city, something like that, that, that acknowledges that we're, uh, we're in that umbrella now that we weren't when these were first put together. And I'm thinking of this in terms of say a year from now, when we have a, a concept come across the advisory board agenda, um, element properties comes in and they want to do X, Y, and Z on one of our, our projects. 
I'd like this five-year plan goal to be kind of our, the litmus test that we use so we can hold up their proposal against what we say our goals are to see if it matches. Um, and so the more, more we can weave that into this, the more helpful it can be long-term. Yeah, Kathy, I think it's maybe getting with Joni. Um, so, cause what I hear you, what I hear you saying in this is, you know, that aligns with uh, Envision Longmont um, and the city's comprehensive plan. So as we're considering this, um, you know, sort of the things we talk about with developments, livable, walkable, um, uh, dense, urban communities. And so I think as we talk about that, maybe working with Joni to take those concepts and bring them into this so that, for example, when we look at a project, it's not the traditional suburban style apartment concept, but is really in alignment with, the, with our vision, which is that more urbanized sort of look where we're maximizing the land that we have. Is that what I hear you saying, Cameron? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Polly. <clears throat> Polly. Um, I would like us to remember, though, that the whole point of a housing authority is a national goal. It, it stems from uh, depression era, but it actually is a national goal that has been around for hundreds of years to provide and it should be one of our national principles to, that everybody needs shelter, everybody needs a decent home. And we need to uh, keep that in mind that that is really our, our only overall goal and objective and mission and whatever is that every human being in this country deserves to have decent housing. And that's a national goal. It really has nothing to do with <clears throat> the city, but how we actually act that out does ha actually have to do with the city uh, and the Envision Longmont plan. But um, I, I would like us to not lose track of the fact that all housing authorities are a national program and are overseen by national and statewide um, boards and uh, authorities. It's a good, a good grounding reminder. So should we move on to some of the other um, goals and objectives in the list? How about number two, to protect and enhance the properties and programs the LHA operates? Be comfortable with this as written. Uh, I have a question. Oh, uh, the properties, yes. What are we talking programs? What programs are we talking about? The Housing Choice Voucher Program would be the primary one. Okay. That helps. Okay. Well, and I think when you get into some of our other properties, specifically when we look at the suites and we yeah. look at the 202 properties in terms of the supportive services that we provide associated with those, those properties. So in that area, we'll go there. But predominantly HCV. Mm-hmm. And really, you know, to me, you know, what you'll hear me say to the board is, is really coming in and, um, you know, this is really about maintaining and connecting. What I would like to do is um, talk about setting some aspirational goals where we try to increase the amount of housing choice vouchers by X over X amount of time so that we, we can set something that we can definitely work on. And, and, and really set, and we'll talk about this as staff, but really set something where it, um, when I say aspirational, the likelihood of us meeting it is not high. Um, set it high enough to where you can really go and then we can measure and understand and report back as to why we are or we're not making progress. So that, that's a piece of that that I would like to see. You're talking about the actual number of vouchers. Mm -hmm. 
what I would like to add to that is getting people up and off the voucher. Right. Okay. That I would like to see a, a turnover. And I don't, I don't know that we've ever tracked that. Um, and I, I think that would be a neat goal uh, considering our discussion under item one. Uh, I think it would be a neat goal that we turn it over. We have, we fill more vouchers, but we also turn them over. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. Actually, last night, um, our partners with VCP, they give challenge coins as they rotate folks out of their uh, tiny homes. So they move yeah. them from the tiny yeah. home into a voucher and then into market rate. And so when they do that, they give them challenge coins. And I saw that last night and was thinking about, so how do we do that? And I think that is going back to your previous question, partnerships with Workforce Boulder County, all of these groups so that we right. can transition and move. Right. Because that's a different way to add capacity. Okay. Okay. I stays the same. You just. Mm -hmm. Got it. Polly. Um, I, I really, I like this. Um, um, but I think, I think one of the things that uh, there's nothing more important than protecting and enhancing the properties and the programs that we operate. I think that um, one of the things we have done with the uh, transition from uh, what we had, uh, Longmont Housing Authority, what we had to what we now have is that we have greatly done this with something that's not even listed here. We, our finances have been uh, I feel uh, shored up and strengthened and are on the right path. I felt like we were not at all on the right path before. And now we actually know what we're doing. We have a, 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 a really hearty and clean system that is much easier to audit, much easier to take care of. And I feel like we know that our um, properties are going to be able to be maintained and protected uh, because we have the financial base before I felt like it was really quite chaotic. And um, so even though this isn't listed, you know, at the heart of this is that we have the financial ability to maintain and protect our programs. So I, I think we've done swell on this. <laughs> uh, so I wonder if we want to want to actually address that. Cause I think that's a key point. Um, under this number two, one would be um, ensuring that we have continued financial stability and the ability to carry out our mission. And then the second, I was thinking of as I look at enhance the properties, um, do we want to talk about the actual property? You know, uh, you know, ma make sure that every single property asset, every single residence is, you know, meets code, is, is well-maintained, is, is being renewed and updated uh, as often as reasonably possible. A lot of the kind of things that would have helped us avoid uh, HUD's partnership with us over the past several years, if you want to call it a partnership. Um, so I wonder if we want to put the physical infrastructure into this plan at all. So t a couple things that I wrote down as part of this discussion uh, to add to maybe number two is around maintaining operational and replacement reserves um, that meet the, the requirements of, meet or exceed the requirements of the um, investor funding. Um, we can add something around the code and HQS, decent, safe and sanitary housing kind of thing. You know, Kathy, I think this may be the place I heard earlier as we talk about the resyndication process where we may get reinvest, re you know, the re reinvestment and resyndication in properties. And we set the goal. I mean, we set the, the measurable target on this. Of, and maybe this is what we need to do is look at it and go, if we're going to do this and we're going to be aggressive in the reinvestment to Cameron's, to, well, to everyone's point, but what Cameron just mentioned, here's the schedule we want to hit. And we lay that schedule out. So we hold ourselves accountable to the timing on this. And then if we can't do it, we need to report back to the advisory board and the board and go, well, here was the schedule here. What, here's what happened. But I think 
set that plan in this where we can really target it and we can probably spend some time before the ninth on pulling that together. I think that's what I hear you all say. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying is if we have a, 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 a specific plan and a target for regularly maintaining and upgrading our, our portfolio. And we are implementing new policies and procedures around that as well. So there, it was haphazard, <laughs> I think, in the, in the past to a certain extent. Um, but Lisa had, and the maintenance team have instituted very specific um, policies and procedures around um, inspecting the properties and, and maintaining them and, mm -hmm. and working with the city to try and have um, standardized features within properties as well so that we aren't buying all kinds of different faucets, for example, but we have, you know, a faucet that is used that, um, you know, is easily accessible. We could even have a couple spares and, and move forward that would save time and money. Okay. Well, and you know, fine. Oh, go ahead. Oh, are there any properties that need to be refurbished in the next five years that we know, just like Aspen Meadows, um, and we could put them kind of on the goals of saying, hey, we will refurbish XYZ properties um, within the next five years? Yeah, we have Village Place, apartment, Aspen Meadows Apartments. N neighborhood. Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Neighborhoods, yeah. Aspen, Aspen Meadow Neighborhood, Village Place, and then we probably hit Lodge Hearthstone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, and then especially we, if they come out of the 202 program, we're exploring that to try and take them out of the 202, yeah. um, in which case we're probably, well, we will have to do a capital needs assessment of what needs to happen, if anything, that major that needs to be replaced and then have a plan for how we're going to do that in order to take them out of the 202 program. So, so yeah, I mean, that you, you know, and, and what's important about this is financially for us, and you've heard me talk about this, understanding that schedule and sticking to it is incredibly important because that brings revenue into the system. Just like understanding for us, the development of these new properties is important because um, what I've learned in this, and, and I talked to you all about it, I didn't quite understand. I was seeing things like one-time funding that was being used for ongoing expenses. Well, what happened was, is the, the resyndication and the development was supposed to be treated as an ongoing revenue stream for different properties. Well, when, when, when that slowed down, that ultimately is what hit financially to everything else. And so that's why I really like the idea of planning this out because that ensures that that revenue stream is coming in continually and when we know it's about to end we need to start planning on what the next new development is so we can keep it and then it allows us to really plan for how we collectively start managing the budget from an operational basis to ensure that there may be a point in time where we can't do anything new or rehab for a few years we at least plan for it so that it's not hitting us all of a sudden Anything else on number two? All right, let's roll to number three, to develop an organizational infrastructure so that LHA can efficiently manage its operations. Step one, ask city to take over operations. Check. Check. <laughs> that was, a, that was a, a long, hard check though. It, about two years of the making and painful. Yes. <laughs> and gray hair inducing, I know. All right, so here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven objectives relating to our organizational infrastructure. Uh, Cameron, yes, I would just as soon toss out objective one. I think it's too, you know, if we're going to have a goal of being high performing, just say that. Um, but then define high performing is going to get us into a lot of detail. So I just assume throw it out and let's just put in 
the objectives, what is high performing and, and make that instead of this fluffy phrase that's an objective one. So I like that it. nobody agrees with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Being a, a high performing agency that is related to the, um, I think it's a CMAP score, um, yeah. mm -hmm. which is under the section eight program. So it is very specific. Um, criteria about what you have to do and a whole point system to get high points, medium, low, underperforming, I, in yeah, trouble. I, <laughs> yeah, I would rather have it stated that way, just how you described it, rather than to say high performing. It, it sounds like an ad slogan instead. Polly, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm glad you explained that, Kathy. I agree with Jean because uh, it sort of seems like we're looking backwards and saying we have to, we're so ashamed. We have to make up and make ourselves, reclaim our, our reputation or something. Um, I would just say maintain our status as a high performing agency, even if we're not there right now. Um, I would rephrase it a little differently so it doesn't look like we're claiming we're ashamed of ourselves and we have to uh, somehow make up for something in the past is sort of backward looking. I, I want us to be uh, forward looking and forget about, uh, not forget about, but just um, move forward. How about consistently achieve a designation as a housing? Yes, a that would be agency, good. Something like that. Yes, that would be good. And then, and then because then it, there then it makes clear that it is a national uh, standard that yeah. we are we are trying we are going to uphold yeah that's a good idea okay you want to move on to the second one cameron please cuz i'm objecting to that one too cuz that's not an that shouldn't be an objective that should be a task that meets the objective of one i see non setting <laughs> Okay. Agreed. Well, uh, honestly, if we want to get down to just like three goals, I would say let's ax this one entirely if we want to be tracking this. Because I think, you know, number one and two yeah. are our priorities. And yeah. if we just want to get down to three different goals, I'd say let's not necessarily worry about this one. Yeah. This is what we want to do. And I think that's where we can come in and maybe set the operational goals for yep. us to say what we want to do and and that becomes i mean to me obviously we didn't want to skew the conversation today but what i would say these are really operational goals mm -hmm. that we need to do internally as administrators and and you know i would probably when i see karen jumping in well, we want to I, talk I think I think they're operational standards. Yeah. It is yeah. the standards of excellence yeah. that yeah. we should be performing every day. And so, so I'm not sure it fits given. here. Yeah. I'm not sure it fits. And then I think to the operational goals, we then go and we're more aggressive, kind of what Lisa's doing that says um, the standards we want to set is our vacancy rate will be this. Um, our mm -hmm. turnover rate will be this. Right. Um, our time to flip will be this. And I think those right. are things we need to work on. And, and so I actually, I would agree with kind of what uh, both Gene and Tom are saying, but Tom's point of, I don't know yes. if it fits into this section. Yeah, I agree with, I agree with, with Tom that this is too operational. And for me, what I, what I ask you all and the, and the board to do, set our targets. Tell me from a policy perspective what you want us to achieve, and then it's our job to achieve it. And then if we don't achieve it, then you all hold us accountable for not achieving it. And um, sort of as a overarching philosophy for me. Mm -hmm. Maybe under one of the other categories, we just have an objective that 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 uh, the LHA and I'm thinking the the board and the advisory board. <clears throat> ensures that the administration of the LHA establishes and achieves kind of high performing operational goals that are in support of all, the balance of our mission.
Yeah. Did we have any objective? We get into the issue with measuring that though, Cameron. It's like we just yeah. we got to kind of put together how do we measure that. Word count, I just say of at least 500 words. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, think, I think if you did that, I think what if you did that, what we could do is then take the objectives like I just talked about mm -hmm. and apply the objectives to the point of, here's what HUD says to be high performing on right. HCV, here's what we need to do. Right. Here's what we do on the time frames. And so it really becomes the objectives underneath that broad goal of, of that you talked about, and I th um, and we can maybe work on some stuff and refine it for y'all. But to your point, Tom, I think it's yes. important because if you just say it and you don't have the measurable objectives, then it becomes nebulous again. Mm -hmm. And and so I think we could really try. We can work to try to fill that. Otherwise, we're back to where we started. Well, well, then I have another question too for you, Harold. How is how is the voucher program? Um, how, how, how does HUD determine additional vouchers that can be used by the housing authority? Is it a formula based? Like how can we expand that and increase the number of vouchers that we have? Or maybe Kathy, this is a question for you. Well, so part of it's a, a budget versus how many vouchers you can use and, and what's going on in the community. So our budget, um, and we're using all of our budget and right now we can only do 400 some vouchers even though we are allowed to go up to 509, I think it is. Um, the rents right now are not aligning um, with the budget. Um, so you can apply for additional vouchers, additional budget, but you have to have good performance in order to do that and show that there's a need. Sometimes they only open it up so every so often. And then there's special programs like the moving to work program or, um, well, they're doing away with the SRO program, the single room occupancy one, or the substantial rehab one. They have a whole bunch of separate programs as well that you need to. And, and we just had the emergency mm -hmm. housing choice vouchers. That was a special allocation. So I think to answer your question, you need to be high performing in the way they measure you so that when there are opportunities that present themselves, you fall into those opportunities. And it's like most federal programs, the stronger you are and the better, the higher they rate you, the more able you're going to be to increase. And, and I think that's what at least Karen and Kathy and I've talked about. I think we may have historically missed opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if this is incorrect, Kathy, Karen, catch me on it, but my gut would say, I don't think we've, I think historically we haven't been able to take advantage of opportunities because of perception and how we operated. And so we need to get to that high level so that when there are funds available, they look to us and go, this is somebody who can use it, use it well, spend it fast and do this. Similar to kind of what's happening, the example I will use on, is on the CDBGDR work that we're doing with the state where we're at a point now where they, they come and say, here's money collaborative, here's money Longmont, because they know we can turn it, we can meet all of their requirements. We need to be in that same position with um, HUD. Is that a fair statement, Kathy? Yeah, I think the other thing is, is philosophically, and it might be tied to the goal about reducing the dependence on HUD, um, I'm not sure. I think that's part of the reason why some of the opportunities under the Housing Choice Voucher Program weren't aggressively pursued. And development opportunities were. And it, it, if you look at BHP and what they've done, they have 1,200 vouchers and a high level of new construction. So I think it's really has to be both together in right. order to really sufficiently house the community that needs it. And I think philosophically for you all on this, I mean, that is probably the diff that's probably one of the big differences in the city coming in versus what was there. You know, we're not saying we're, we're not saying we don't need to rely on HUD. We're saying we need to rely on HUD, but we need to be judicious on where we rely on HUD. And so the 202 property is probably not where we need to go, 
but we need to take advantage of the programs and rely on them so we can add operational dollars. And I think that's probably one of the biggest differences today versus what you all were told before, and I can't control that, is we're saying, no, we need them there, but where it makes sense, not just we need them out. And I think that's where boards and everyone else are so dependent on staff um, in, in these issues. And, and, and that's why we want to educate everyone so you can check us if you go, well, this doesn't make sense, because you know what you know. Yeah, kind of, kind of along with that. So the, the vouchers, I was just trying to come up with, you know, we're trying to come up with measurable goals. How many additional vouchers should we then say? Can we say we want to increase our vouchers, say, by 10% in five years? And then... I would say 25 and then give us something to reach for. 25%. So, yeah. Kendra, what, what is the realistic opportunity to <laughs> increase our vouchers short of having additional um, programs that we might be able to apply for? Yeah, so honestly, it's all dependent upon rent. Like right now, everybody's receiving, the, the average subsidy holder is receiving about $1,100 in subsidy from our voucher program. When the rents lower, we have more money and more budget to release more vouchers. But as rents increase, we lose the opportunity. And so I don't know that they were effectively um, following the two-year tool in the past. So they weren't vouchering up and they weren't spending enough money. Therefore, HUD wasn't giving them more money every year. Um, so so we, did, we, we didn't spend enough money this year, but we are at a limit where we probably can't add any more vouchers yet because of the rental increase that has, has occurred. Um, therefore, we're already into our two-year two -year limit so that we don't go bankrupt. And that's what we've kind of learned is that sometimes housing authorities go, you know, full force in that first year and don't realize it's really a two year analysis and they go bankrupt the next year because now they can't Eat their provide hat. these vouchers that they've released. So well, it's really, go ahead. Oh no, I, it's, 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 it's a, a monitoring. Monthly, yeah. It's a monthly analysis that we're doing now with this two year tool of, and we did just release 10 vouchers um, and have leased those up or at nine, I think. Um, total. So, so we're watching that and monitoring it. And the more we can, we can push or talk to HUD about, you know, you know, if we have X number of folks on our wait list and we can't serve them, is there any ability to get additional budget? Those kinds of conversations we need to, we need to start having and, and really pushing for, I think. Well, and this, you know, I'll use the, what everybody refers to as a heraldism. It is the spin cycle that we get into in that if you don't spend your money, they'll even consider taking your money away, right, Kendra? And so you have to spend your money in order to get money. But if we historically weren't spending the money, then we need to spend it so A, they don't take it away, but then show the need so that then when the increase in the rents and everything comes into place, we positioned ourselves to get more money, which then allows us to look at other concepts. And so it really is anchored in that high performance and setting the target goal of we wanna increase by X. And in order to do that, it's Kendra's explanation that you start building out and what you need to do to reestablish, rebaseline and position yourself for growth. But yeah, it comes back to being efficient and high performing. Yeah. And if you're not, then you're not gonna get the money, so. Correct. And tracking it and just tracking it all yeah. the time. That's the thing. I will add too, with the number of uh, additional um, property owners that have come into the program just so far, that's telling us something. Um, I don't know how off that is from prior years. I think it's pretty off. I think it's a lot more. Um, just anecdotally, we'd have to do some statistic gathering. Um, but I think that's telling us something. And one of them was a major property manager um, that came back on to the, the program. So something might start shifting in the market. Um, is 
is what I'm taking from that, that there might be a, a shift in rents going down a little bit or something for them to come back onto the program and have that guaranteed income where before they dropped off when rents were increasing and they could have guaranteed income already. So we'll, we'll monitor it and see. It's all monitoring. So as it relates to uh, this third goal, are we comfortable removing that and kind of restating it as a, a kind of administrative goal that we just make sure that they have a plan in place and we double check the the objectives in that administrative yes, plan? Yes, Cameron, I agree with removing it. Okay. Anyone else object to that? All right, let's move on to number four. And as I just glance at this, I'm wondering if this is already captured somewhere else, but, but um, the, the goal is to develop, enhance, and strengthen external relationships with key partners, other agencies, and the larger community. It's hard to argue that that's important, but I wonder if, is it its own individual goal? And if it is, fine. By the way, I, I'm not saying we have to have three of, only three of these. I just like that number. <laughs> I just want it closer to three. So this is something that you have done in the past. You've partnered with Habitat, you've partnered with Longmont Community Housing, um, you're partnering with Element um, moving forward. Um, I think it's a, it, what isn't here is some of the other um, more soft service relationships, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and they might be well captured in some of the other things. It's, uh, goals, especially with some of the changes that we have made. Um, but those around, um, uh, what's the dream, the dreamers? Um, I have a dream. I have a dream. <laughs> um, and some of the, the rice things, some of the other um, softer services that we talked about, um, serving on some of the different collaboratives and teams that the, the is out in the community around homelessness, around um, well, primarily homelessness, but also some of the other affordable housing um, collaboratives that we have going. Um, in the past, there have been quite robust partnerships, and then it kind of fell off. Um, but I think there's certain ones that um, really should be um, attended again by various um, housing authority staff so that they know what's going on in the community, they can react to things, they can have input, et cetera, about what they're, um, we're experiencing. Um, and then the whole development of housing. Um, yeah, some of this is, is captured in probably number one, creating affordable housing opportunities, um, but it felt important enough to call it out separately that really it is around partnership, additional partnership opportunities. Karen? So if a, a suggestion, um, and again, we wouldn't necessarily do it on the fly here today, but, but partnerships uh, can also be really seen as an approach. I think as Kathy mentioned that we have partnerships um, kind of interspersed into the different uh, goal areas and objectives. So if, if, if you wanted us to look at how to consider partnerships as an approach and making sure that we inc include a partnership approach into some of these other um, goals and outcomes, we could certainly approach it that way. Because they really, you don't just partnership just to have it, you know. <laughs> there, there's a reason that you have a partnership, and it really is to accomplish, you know, the the various goals and and um, objectives that you have set forth. I kind of like that. I mean, as I was talking earlier about you know, the three basic things that I thought we do. Um, I mean, to me, we 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 establish these goals, and if it's right within our wheelhouse, we do it. Uh, but the farther it gets from that core, the more we have to engage other partners in the process. Um, so 
so I, I my sense is that it's sort of woven through the other pieces it's it's a tool that we use to achieve the goals not necessarily goal in and of itself um but i do think i do hear what kathy's saying about it being important enough that we we might want to call it out in some fashion so well, and it kind of goes along with that, that spectrum that you guys gave us last meeting, where those are all the other, um, um, you know, either transitional housing or shelters that fit into the whole housing need. And we're just one, one part of that as well. So what do we do with this one? Well, I'll, I'll go back to, uh, I don't think we can measure it again. <laughs> I mean, we could put it out there, but there's nothing, honestly, I, I see that we can measure it with unless, you know, we're just, you know, actively doing it. Um, can I give you all a suggestion based on what I've heard? Please. So what I would do is take this one and then take your other goals that you established. And, and, and this may in some cases fall under the objectives of some of the other goals or be a goal within its, uh, within its own component in the other sections. And then to the point of, okay, now how do we, what do we do to achieve this? And, and then how do we put it in a way where we can measure it and understand whether or not we're making progress? So we may need to refine some of these. Um, and I don't have my usual three screens, so I'm, I'm back and forth. So um, if you go to partner with local nonprofit agencies, um, we can get specific and to say, who do we want to partner with? How do we want to partner with them? And what do we want to create? Um, first right of refusal clauses that goes into our development work. Um, you know, how many land donations are on site construction do we want to get on an annual basis? And in the land donation, I think for the housing authority is the most important piece so that they're at the forefront of the conversation with the developers who are building. So, you know, we want X number of acres a year via land donation to the housing authority um, through the inclusionary housing process. I think that's how we can get some of these and, and put it in other sections. Um, Point five, um, our, the objective is home ownership. I think that goes back to the previous conversations that we've had on the development side and maybe we blend it in there. So we can work on that for you all, but I really see this as being components of the other goals and objectives. And these may be tasks that helps us achieve that. Kathy, Karen. I think that works. So I, I like that suggestion. The one, the one piece when we just touch on number five uh, to, that I was going to suggest we try to weave in this somehow is, is to have some goals and objectives that are, are focused on our residents. There's a lot of focus on development and, and programs and buildings, but, 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 uh, I'd like to have something in here that talks about the people and what we're doing to make their lives better in the, you know, through these other things. And I think those other things are doing that, but I just would like to see it in the text here in some fashion. You, you know, I would agree. And I was going to suggest that to, to me, I think number five really is about the people. I mean, it could be. And so, mm -hmm. so I just think, um, so, so maybe we can look at how, how do we shore that one as about the people and then other things that we need to move elsewhere, you know, we can, but yeah. It, unless you, if you don't want a people goal, that's okay. But it, that one is what that one seems to be about. I, I want a people goal. Well, it would be the third goal. 
because you've knocked out three and four were weaving into the other one. So you only have two so far. <laughs> and I think where I was going on the of three in the people goal, I think we were still talking about development and those things. Mm -hmm. And so when we want to look at it for people, it's, um, there's some operational components in terms mm -hmm. of how fast, when we have problems, how fast do we respond to problems in units mm -hmm. and, and get them back? So that's more of an operational component to the people. Then we look at how do, you know, how do we create program partnerships to provide more services that we're not in order to support people or programs, you know, what kind of pro, how, you know, develop programs that we offer in each one of the residential units so that we, I don't know, Karen, this is Karen's world more than mine, <laughs> um, but it's the pro kind of properties, programs, and people. Yeah. And on the people, what do we give yeah. our tenants? So it's not just a house, right? but it's a community okay. and it supports them in the community. And I, I think this and what Jean has been saying about the, the move on, move on, right. move up options or opportunities. I think that's mm -hmm. where this one could go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I add, can I add to that? Yeah, go Am ahead. I, and then I think Paul okay. had something. Um, well, I've got this mute sign up there and I don't understand that. Um, uh, in terms of the family properties, which I'm, I'm delighted to see us looking at doing more of, um, the, the uh, grow part is critical. And what we talked about with daycare and other services that can be coordinated. Um, we also have, we still have all these senior properties. Um, and that's a different, it's a different animal. It, it, it's got to be handled differently. We, we won't have the same goals for seniors as we're going to have for the families. Seniors, we need to focus on keeping their life as comfortable and pleasant as they can for however long they're going to be here. Um, so the programs need to fit the property. Do you make sense? Okay. And, and the one piece that we talked about that I didn't see it on this, um, but what I would say is that we need to think about too is as we think about programs and opportunities and partnerships, one of the things that I'm seeing that um, we're challenged with on a regular basis, and I'm trying to think if it's in there, I can't go back and forth, but what we know is that in terms of affordable housing for older adults, um, what we have is independent living. What we're seeing though, is that there are folks that probably shouldn't be in independent living um, because of everything from where they are with their uh, physical abilities to mental abilities, dementia coming into play, all of those things. And so I think, I don't know if it's in the development, the partnership world or what it is, but it really is how do we look at opportunities to partner with folks to have other opportunities for those that may need more uh, robust services than independent living. Um, because what it does is it also pressures us operationally in different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so I don't know if it's a development goal, if it's a program goal, but it, it fits into this mix of how do you have affordable opportunities for assisted living or even um, some of our memory care components that are coming into play. And again, that may just be a facilitator, Yes, but it's in the mix. And exactly. We might just be the facilitator for that because uh, we run into two problems. One is um, people are, are in independent living and they can do some of the independent living stuff, but they still aren't disabled enough to move into to be accepted into assisted living right. so we've got this gap that we're inadvertently filling that doesn't exist in the private sector um the uh, um but the other thing is that um 
maybe there are services that, that, that we can tap into to bring into the independent environment that will help with the people that have mental and more severe physical. Um, and, and right now that's done through insurance companies but eat for each individual, but there might be something that gets developed on a broader scale so that we can refer uh, our residents to it. But that's, that's a dream I've got. Well, and, and I'm having conversations with a local group right now that provides services like grocery shopping. They can come in and maybe cook and they can do other things. And they approached us. And so those are things we can maybe build in. I'm being vague and cagey right now because it's not to the point where they want to be known but um i think those are we got to figure out where it fits because we've got to start working and targeting this issue because we we can see it impacting us and challenging us um in many cases lisa i would argue on a daily basis at times holly yeah, I, it, it's a very, very difficult situation because, you know, we do have a lot of senior living and there comes a point where many people become severe, much more severely disabled physically, but also sometimes mentally. And it, it, somewhere along the line, somebody has to call it and say, we can't take care of you here anymore because it's too dangerous for you. But also, as, as you said, Harold and uh, Jean, there are, there are services I know when my mother was getting older, um, she became blind and she was still just as feisty as ever and extremely independent, but she did need some help with uh, bathing to be healthy, you know, to be help, uh, to be safe and with cleaning and with uh, a few things like that. And if we had um, a partnership with one of those services where you, you, somebody could come in and just spend a little bit of time with somebody, clean up a little bit, talk while you're cleaning up and you know, help somebody with a few of those personal issues, uh, that would help them stay in um, in our facilities longer, but at some point, this is very difficult. When do you say to somebody, you have to go somewhere else? Yeah. That's a terrible thing to say and uh, devastating. And, um, but on the other hand, we can't have people living in our, in, uh, our housing that are not really being properly taken care of. Because but Holly yeah, Polly, sometimes we don't have a choice because yeah. we cannot evict somebody on that. We w would not right. evict anybody on that. Right. But we have to have their family agree yes. and get them to move because yes. especially in a memory, uh, you know, a dementia, Alzheimer's situation, yes. that person doesn't know that they're no, the trouble right. they're in. That's um, right. And, and so getting the family involved, it can yes. be extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it can take two or three years and it, it, it's scary. Yeah. So w having something that we can access and bring on site would be extremely yes. helpful because not only for that resident, because that kind of situation affects every other resident. Yes, You're in a small does. building, okay? So, well, and I want to be clear, um, there are times where depending on what's happening with an individual, if the individual is threatening the safety of the entire comp area, yeah, it has to then, be. then yeah. we will evict because um, right. you, you can't threaten 50 other households because yeah. of routine fires and things like that. And so yeah. we're also balancing and, and mm -hmm. I know this sounds hard. We're balancing the individual with everyone else. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we have to ensure the safety of everyone in the property. So I wanted to, yeah. to be clear on this. There are times when we have to do that. And it's when it is a direct threat to the safety 
of the mm-hmm. other folks who are living in the complex. And is that the That's way to right. say it, Karen? Yeah, I think absolutely. And um, and Lisa might want to chime in, but 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 obviously we do everything in our um, right. influence mm-hmm. to, um, to, to help <laughs> make that transition work right. uh, for the benefit right. of, of the residents. Right. Yeah, yeah, we do everything we can, but there, I mean, we've encountered times where the safety issue has become so significant, we've had to do what we've had to do. Because it is an yeah. independent living property, and at some point right. in time, even with services, right. it is um, mm-hmm. it, it is no longer the right housing for for yeah. individuals. Yeah, and part of exactly. it is. And I just want to go ahead. Oh, I was going to say last week, um, just kind of a partnership with the senior services that Michelle was able to help us. We did get a resident into a care facility up in Bertha um, that takes Medicare. Get them out of the situation he was in at the lot, sorry, at the Hearthstone, that was making it unpleasant for other residents, the fire department. It was a great collaboration, the fire department making reports, us making reports, senior services making reports, all of our agencies working together to better the life of one resident. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I just had to jump in because I didn't want folks to think that because I mean, and you'll probably get complaints when we have to deal with it. And and I wanted to be very clear where we are. Right. Yeah. All right. So have we provided enough guidance on that final goal, Kathy? I don't know why my space bar wasn't working anymore. So I would like to hear thoughts. Do we want to go into home ownership? That is a big difference and a big leap for what the housing authority is doing. It was talked about last time. I wasn't sure whether it was truly getting into providing home ownership opportunities or more pre- trying to prepare people for um, that growth opportunity and um, step up um, from, from rental housing for families in particular but I would like to hear more from the advisory board around that. Polly? You know, I, the only way to get people out of uh, the constantly escalating rents and uh, lack of control over their life, <laughs> of being a renter is to get them into home ownership. But the problem is that they have to be able to afford it long-term or else we're not doing anybody any favors. We're actually creating a worse situation for them. We already do have uh, some kind of assistance and we also have lots of counseling on on financial uh, and credit issues and how to help people get into those. I think that's a great idea. I would like us to see if we can provide, you know, if we can build some home ownership possibilities. So far, we've kind of turned that over to Habitat, which does an excellent job because they do sweat equity and they do extensive counseling. But um, I would like to see us do more to help provide home ownership opportunities because that is ultimately the best way for our society to, for, to pass on intergenerational wealth and to create a better situation for most people in our society. Um, I mean, I, I say we partnership with Habitat for Humanity, but I think we have such a need right now for low-income rentals that that's, that's where we fit in, and that's kind of what our goal is. Um, the, the other thing I forgot to mention, too, is maybe we focus also on, like, the 50% AMI properties as well because we seem to be saturated in the 30% AMI, but I see us as providing – affordable rentals. And if there is some housing, um, we, we could see if it's a possibility, if it would fit, like, especially if we get a land donation that it would work better as a housing uh, for, you know, uh, actually houses that people can purchase, but 
you know, I think we just stick to our niche and our, our swim lane and just be uh, affordable rentals. Holly? Some of these uh, in our last um, goal, <laughs> uh, some of these things talk specifically about this, and I mentioned this earlier. We can help people, a lot of, a lot of places in the world do this. We can help people gradually get into this by ha putting them in a situation where they can self-finance them, this themselves over time through cooperatives, through rock and organizations like that. Or we can buy the land, they can buy it back from us. And that way it stays affordable. And I just don't think we are, I, I really do think that we need to be thinking about ways that we can um, help people get into home ownership with different models like cooperatives, rent to own and uh, community land trusts and um, uh, did I say cooperatives? Mm -hmm. Yes, anyway, things where the city buys the land or the city has the land and then they can buy it back from us at a much lower rate that they would buy, be buying a home otherwise. And then they can own it and maintain it and take care of it themselves. In other words, we help them up front in a gradual way, and then they can take care of it themselves. Harold? Harold? You know, one of the things, if I can make another suggestion, is when we look at the home ownership piece, and maybe we frame it as a partnership on home ownership, because when I look at what we do on the city side, so now not the LHA side, but the city side, and you look at down payment assistance, we purchase nine acres of property for affordable housing. It may be that that's probably operationally a better fit on the city side, but, but we partner with with each other across to, to accomplish that goal because we have that system built internally. And if we wanted to create, so for example, in the nine acres that we're purchasing associated with the Costco project, you know, what we may want to do is go out for, and again, this, this manufactured housing starts showing itself again, but really create an RFP for here's what we want to do in terms of home ownership opportunities, but maybe the housing authorities piece on this is it all may not be home ownership. It may be a mix of rental and home ownership to kind of then blend and have transitions, but maybe it's framed more in a partnership to ensure that we have affordable home ownership partnerships with the city side of the house to ensure that we have affordable home ownership opportunities so that when we do transition people, there are things available for them to transition into. And that may be kind of channeling Tom's comment, maybe how we frame that conversation, because I would suggest we don't want to necessarily duplicate it um, if we already have something that we're building on this side of the house. Yeah, I like that. Kathy, is that clear enough to work into uh, something for discussion next month? Yes, I think so. Arlene, you had your hand up before. Oh, did sorry, you? I missed that. Well, the only thing I was going to say was that I, I think it's important to work with people towards home ownership. I just don't want us to be the ones that get stuck with a house that's been totally trashed. Um, you know, and, and then we have to go in and, and do something about it. I think homeownership, we can help them get there and then they need to they need to pick up the ball and deal with it at that point. So it seems like that LHA's role is really help to facilitate, um, you know, folks being able to move into homeownership, but our wheelhouse is in terms of building and managing um, properties is, is really at the affordable rental arena. That, that's our wheelhouse in terms of what we own and, and manage. Is that correct? And then, you know, what I would throw in Karen and Kathy, there's this gray area that I've been in in other communities. Um, and so I've talked to Kathy about this, where we partnered with the National Development Council, where 
they sort of blend the models in a rent to own concept. And, and let me just baseline, not rent to own as we all know it, where it basically fleeces the individuals um, of what they're putting in in rent, but truly rent to own where you work in the programs and you transition it. And in that partnership, that may be where the housing authority does fit from a property management perspective, because on the front end of that program, you're managing the property, knowing they're moving to home ownership. And then you start the transition. And I think, again, it's a gray area, but that's that partnership because there may be a piece in a model like that that does fit more on this side of the house than it fits on the other side of the house. We've never really had that opportunity as a city. When I did it in the other community, that company ended up having to take it all because we didn't really do that. Um, but they, they do models where if you have the capacity, they work with you in taking that approach. So kind of refining that partnership model. So are we ready to uh, move on from this or do we want to discuss this a little bit more? I, I suggest that we move on. Um, Looking at our schedule, I don't know who's running this meeting, but we're way over time. Uh, I'd, I'd like to move to, to 4B, options for in-person meetings. Uh, first, I'll just share my personal thought. I'm ready for in-person meetings. Um, so if there is an opportunity for that, a good location for that, I'm all ears. Arlene? And, and I'm open to in-person meetings too. I would just like to know from Harold, can you just give us, you know, a real short version of what exactly the restrictions are? It's pretty COVID. much, there's pretty much not, unless you go over, what's the number now, Karen? I think they've removed all restrictions as of the other day. Even removed the numbers. Yeah, they removed the numbers. So we're, we're good to go. Okay. Unless, again, it's in specific, you know, unless you're in congregate settings or child care or, you know, things like that. But for our purposes, than, we're good. We're free. We're, we're, we have freedom. <laughs> okay. Other than if you're not vaccinated, they still, you know, encourage you to wear a mask if you're unvaccinated, but we're good. So I would suggest that when the next meeting comes out, you all just tell us where we're supposed to go and we just go there. Oh, councils, do you want it in a formal setting or a less formal setting? For the advisory board? Mm -hmm. I, I kind of like the less formal setting. Um, just makes sure. the kind of things we discussed. Less formal. Yeah. Let's just do it in the council study session room. And I'll make, we'll make sure it's available, Karen. Okay, so let's move on. I will point out it's 9.53, and so I know we're all, we all maybe have other pressures on us. Um, but we do have the city report, uh, perhaps just a high-level summary if there are things we need to talk touch on. So it looks um, like your report is first, <laughs> Lisa, if you want to, your vacancy report. All right. I guess maybe it's a question of, um, given that we just have about five minutes, is there anything that you have questions about that were in the packet or Lisa, Harold, Kendra, um, is there anything that you really want to make sure that the advisory board knows? Yeah. Yeah. You can go ahead. On the uh, budget to actual, which I was really glad to see. Um, and of course, I focused in on um, Aspen Meadows Senior Apartment under uh, tenant services expenses. There is a huge, I mean, 35,000 actual, yeah. and you only budgeted, we only budgeted less than a thousand. Is that related to the construction moves and that kind of thing? It is. Um, okay. And we are actually going to, we want to, we want to track it separately, but what we're going to do is I'm going to create a separate WIP account for relocation and okay. we're going to move that over onto the balance sheet. Um, right. 
until until it's closed. But yeah, um, it was being tracked as a soft cost, so it should have been expensed. But um, they believe that, some of that can be uh, yeah. expense to the to the whole um, re the whole renovation. Yeah. yeah, correct. Okay, that um, I, I had another question. It's come up several times in the last couple of weeks on um, utilities. The second floor of Aspen Meadows, uh, the lights go the lights go dim in the hallways at night unless somebody comes out into the hallway, but that does not happen on first and third floors. And I was wondering, do you have information that dimming the lights saves on utilities? And if it does, could we implement it on first and third floor? I'm just tossing that out. I'll pass that on to Molly, who's okay. our project should manager. Be, it should be happening on both, and, and yes, um, it reduces the, the usage. Yeah. So that may be, a that's a punch list item. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that is that same process in effect for um, Silver Silver Creek and uh, Fall River? Because at night, you know it it looks like this, Creek. okay. At night, it looks like it's fairly bright over there. I just was wondering if they go dim. I, I don't know. I mean, that was the way it was built, so we'll have to look into it. Um, but that's the change in how we remodel and things that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, Lisa. I do know um, Spring Creek does have that same feature in their hallways. I am not sure about Fall River. Any other questions, Tom? Yeah, just on the, the financial report, um, is this as of May 31st? Yes. Okay. And then the other question I had, though, is just comparing the budget to actual. It seems the actuals are quite a bit higher than what we had budgeted for. You know, for instance, like Aspen Meadows, like the, I'm just looking at it, net uh, tenant income is are 27. You income? Yeah. Yeah, like so we are, we, we are finding a few anomalies that are happening there, um, partly because in the past for the project-based vouchers and the tenant-based vouchers, the housing authority wasn't going up to the fair market rent. Um, and so they're doing that as these vouchers are being recertified so that these subsidy agencies, the problem we found this Friday was that they're also increasing that as the market rent in, within our system, mm -hmm. which is why it's also, so if that unit goes vacant and let's say the, the market rent is now up to the fair market rent of 1412, you're also getting that vacancy at 412 as well. So you're seeing an increase in the vacancies numbers as well. So we're gonna have to do a reconciliation once we get all of these properties market rent back to the LIHTC rent, because that is what can actually be charged to the tenant um, if, if they don't have subsidy. So we need to make sure that's there. So that's why you're seeing an increase. I mean, even in Fall River, um, because of the what they underwrited it as, and that was before they knew about the whole fair market not being done on these vouchers, um, we had to go down for underwriting purposes, budget-wise. So we know we're going to see an increase there in rent as well. Any other questions on the city reports? The only thing I will add, unless it's changed, Cameron, just so you know, um, the calls for service based on the changes we made at Lodge and Hearthstone with the devices, calls for service for police and fire at the suites, those have dramatically decreased um, over the last few months. Um, to the last report, knock on wood, um, that I had from police, we had in a week, we had no calls for service at the suites. Um, and I think we tend to average what well, Lisa one or two. So in terms of where we were on, on a lot of these properties to where we are today, 
there's a significant change that's occurred and that's really the partnership with um, across all properties of the part of the property managers in conjunction with Michelle and senior services and our support services and the in interactions we have. Is that still correct? I wasn't there Friday on the last update, but is that still correct, Lisa? We've had a few calls this week, but it's from me outside of the property that um, police are following up, doing welfare checks and just doing due diligence on, yeah. but no big issues anymore. Good news. Why don't we move on to item six, other business? Anything else for the good of the order here today? All right. Oh, Karen. Oh, so you us so just, just, so I'm sorry. This is just, um, just to, to, to uh, clarify the council retreat is, is actually a six hour window. We will, we will send out an agenda to all of, um, all of the board members um, in terms of when the, I mean, the LHA discussion is a good portion of that retreat. So, um, so we will get that, um, that revised agenda out to you as soon as possible. And we are going to hold the retreat at the Hearthstone community room. So yay, someone you're familiar with, but uh, but that's where we're gonna be holding it. That's Great. it. So we'll wait to hear from you on that. And then I'm, I'm assuming that that's on the ninth, then we'll have a, a follow-up meeting where we can debrief on July 20th. All right, if there's no further business, I will, Declare this meeting adjourned. Thanks for a long morning. We'll talk to you soon.